Good morning, everyone. I'm just waiting for everyone to um, join the meeting. Um, so bear with us a couple of uh, seconds. Hopefully you're all in. Looks like it. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Um, thank you all for joining us online. Um, Obviously, we would have loved to be out in nature today and um, be shown around this incredible uh, nature reserve, which is uh, called Priest Hill. Um, unfortunately, COVID's had other plans for us. Um, so we're back online. Um, and I am absolutely delighted um, that uh, Peter Wakeman and Stephen Nevard have um, offered to do this talk for us um, because there are on the ground experts, there are incredible volunteers that have given up so much of their time to making this nature reserve just incredible haven for nature. Um, so before um, we go into the presentation, I just want to conduct a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you can use the chat to ask questions um, at any point during the presentation. Um, uh, if we could ask you to turn your cameras uh, off and mute yourselves during the presentation, it just helps with um, the, the continuity and uh, lessens the disruptions to our wonderful presenters. Um, during the Q&A session, please feel free to turn your cameras on. You can either use the chat function, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen, to type in a message, or you can um, wave at the screen and we'll um, unmute you and you can ask a question in person. Um, uh, I have to apologize that I can't stay the whole time today, um, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, but we will be recording the event so I can catch up on what happened and um, what questions were asked. Um, so my lovely colleague, Joe Fote, um, who is our behind the scenes guru at uh, promoting the work of uh, Surrey Wildlife Trust, a uh, very busy lady, a brilliant um, a press officer. Uh, she will be taking over and uh, reading out the questions on my behalf. Um, and that's it really. Um, thank you so much for your support and adapting to this ever-changing environment that we're living in right now. Um, and I will pass over to Peter. Um, good luck. All right. Thank you, uh, Sophie. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, Steve and I are volunteers at um, Priest Hill and we have been uh, since the reserve opened uh, six or seven years ago. So we've um, Quite a bit of the, the history in our in our heads and we know what's happened there so what i'd like to do today is to talk through how the reserve started um some of the things that have been um some of the initiatives that have been carried out there by Surrey wildlife trust and and, and in conjunction with the volunteers and uh, have a have a look at um how the plants and the invertebrates have, have benefited and then at the end there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions so start with the, the first slide I, i've entitled it the making of a nature reserve which might seem rather odd because most nature reserves are designated as such because there's something valuable there already there priest hill basically is what i think you could call a restoration reserve it was uh, around 80 acres or a little bit more of derelict land which is quite unusual to um, uh, designate something a nature reserve but um, it's given an awful lot of opportunities to try out various ideas and techniques and um, I think the results have been very encouraging so the, the first question if you haven't been there I don't know where it is is where is Priest Hill so basically um, that's the boundary just there and you've got Yule up there to the northeast um, this is Epsom Epsom town centre down here and apart from a corridor down here, which leads to Epsom Downs, it's entirely surrounded by the suburbs, by, by houses. So it is very much a uh, suburban reserve. Um, right. You might say, why is it called Priest Hill? If you go to Priest Hill, it's pretty much level, whichever way you go, east, west or north, south. Um, and the reason it's uh, called, called, called Priest Hill is that it's on the very edge of the chalk, which starts on the scarp, scarp slope near Box Hill and it goes north, but just north of Priest Hill, the chalk 
uh, stops and the land dips away to the London clays and gravels and of the Thames, Thames Basin. And that means you get some very good views. And so it does appear that you're actually standing on a hill. And in terms of the views, um, I took these um, a year or two ago with my camera, uh, this Tolworth Tower, which is four and three quarter miles away. Um, there's a shard. And if you get it at the right time in the afternoon, when the sun is low, the whole thing gleams, which is uh, it's quite an amazing site. Uh, South Hall Gas Holder, because um, I used to live further north than this, I'm aware of the South Hall Gas Holder. A lot of people might not be, but it's a big landmark. And in fact, they demolished it two years ago, so it no longer exists. So there's a housing estate there, but that was always a good place to look. So that's 13 and a half miles. But Terminal 5 at Heathrow, um, just along there, it stands out nicely. And furthest anything I can identify is the Wembley Arch. And then there's a ridge of hills behind it, which I suspect is Harrow or something like that. But you can see the kind of views that you get, which are quite, uh, yeah, quite spectacular. Right, so a brief history. Um, it was the site of Priest Hill Farm. And um, there's an old postcard here that actually shows the farm, um, which is somewhere over to the uh, west of the, the site at the moment, the horse um, going along a track, but the, that's all gone now. Um, it was sold in 1942 to London County Council, um, and they used it as school playing fields for a while, but they became redundant. And in 1990, that was when things didn't go too well for, it was sold to a developer, and for 23 years, uh, various planning applications were submitted for a golf course and housing and this, that, and the other, all were rejected. And in the end, the developer said to Epsom Manuel, right, what have I got to do? So basically, um, whilst it was becoming derelict, as you can see, it was just open access for anybody and anything went there with car boot sales, fly tipping. Um, a, a deal was done whereby it was, um, they were given planning permission for 15 new houses, but that was conditional um, on approval on provision of an 82 acre nature reserve. So the land was transferred to Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, it, I think it was an excellent deal. A detached house was built for the ranger. There were grazing paddocks laid out. 1,500 tonnes of rubble were removed, which is really detritus of uh, 23 years of uh, use and abuse. Five ponds were constructed. Uh, chalk scrapes, which you talk about a lot, lot more chalk, scrapes, you may, you may have a very valuable um, asset because uh, it's, it's a very rare habitat. And um, basically, you may know that chalk scrapes are created on the downs with some effort just to create um, you know, a good few square meters. But there was about four and a half acres of chalk scrapes. And most important of all, there's an endowment of um, 450,000 to provide for future maintenance. Obviously, the trust wanted to make sure that it wasn't a liability and that they could look after it. So. Here are the new houses that were being built. Um, this is what funded the reserve. This is what they look like now. Um, not what you call starter homes, I have to say, but um, very nice. Um, and this is the house that they built for the ranger, which is still there. And um, one, one, one or two of your colleagues are living there at the moment. It's, it's rented out to them. And uh, it was one of the stipulations of the planning, app, planning permission that that was built first before they did anything else. That was to ensure that the trust got the house and uh, that the others didn't. <laughs> the others weren't built and then they lost the developer. So it was a good, good strategy. Right, so if we talk about the chalk scrapes, um, the, whole, the whole area, apart from one small patch, is on chalk, um, same as the um, rest of this area. So basically, um, the scrapes were created because there are former tennis courts there and the developers removed the tarmac down to the bare chalk and this created a really unique environment for any number of plants which can't take competition but can grow on chalk. So let's look at a satellite photo beforehand. This is the Banstead Road. This is over on the east of the reserve. So these are two areas here of tarmac. And this is what happened um, shortly afterwards. Um, you can see it's gleaming white. All the tarmac was removed and you've got bare chalk there. And on the other side of the reserve, Again, there's a series of um, half a dozen uh, tarmac uh, tennis courts which go down in steps. And this is what it looked like after they'd taken away the tarmac. And, um, and this, actually, this area here is where the new houses were built. And the rest of it is the reserve. 
If you're on the ground at the time, rather than up in a satellite, this is what you'd see. These, um, this is tarmac and um, it's covered in moss now, but it goes down four or five levels there, uh, four levels, I think, on this side. So that was what the developer had to tackle. And so they brought in some heavy digging equipment and um, scraped up all the tarmac, piled it up in heaps, um, and uh, that was all removed from the site. It's no, no, no small job. And there you can actually see the Wildlife Trust's house under construction. Right, so this is what was left. Um, that, that there you saw just now, when the tarmac was removed, got this gleaming white chalk, um, which was uh, left there. This is another area. There are scrapes um, in both on the east and the west side of the reserve. This is another one on the east side. Um, and shortly after it was uh, cleared of the, uh, the tarmac and asphalt. And um, so that was how the scrapes were created. Also, part of the deal with the developer was to create some two large grazing paddocks, which they did by fencing off some areas. And um, there's a quite impressive three kilometers of cattle fencing uh, covered those and um, you know, to, to keep the cattle in. And every winter month, your, your grazing, every, every winter, your grazing team put on uh, cattle. It's uh, belted galloways, and we'll have a look at them in a minute. But um, there's no public access for obvious reasons to these grazing areas. But it's been very, very interesting because it was just a mass of um, oat grass and coarse weeds. And every winter, with more grazing, we're getting better quality of vegetation. And um, we'll, we'll look in a minute at some of the plants that are, that are returning to the grassland. Um, right, so, so these are the two, the two paddocks in red. The blue is the boundary of the reserve. These are the two grazing paddocks. And there are two other distinct areas there um, on, on the reserve that have been created. Um, oh yes, before we go on to that, just to illustrate, this is one of the paddocks. Uh, there, if you look in, in the distance here where the cursor is, that's actually a herd of belted galloways there, probably clustered around a, uh, an altar trough or something, but they do the grazing for us. And that, that's what uh, actually does all the hard work. Belted galloways are very, well, they're, they're a very good breed. They're, they're small, they're not aggressive, uh, they're quite inquisitive, and they're very hardy, as, as their name suggests, they were bred in Galloway in Scotland and they do very well in this part of the world. But you can see this is right at the start when they began grazing. You can see that the meadow areas were just a mass of coarse, coarse grass. There's very few wildflowers there. And um, you know, say the, the Belties have done a, done a really good job in keeping it down and encouraging more valuable growth for us. Uh, don't just get cattle. Um, we get deer on sites and these two actually uh, seem quite happy jumping over the fence, uh, missing the barbed wire, and they, they join the cattle occasionally and um, help, help with the grazing. And um, there were three at one point, but I've only seen two recently. But again, they, uh, just to illustrate what happens, this is one of the paddocks after it's been grazed in early spring. And you can see that that mass of grass that you saw earlier has gone completely. But what was interesting, which we didn't really know, was uh, how many anthills there are there, which is you know, a sign of quite a healthy ecology. So there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of them there, and uh, they're still there now, but in the summer you can't see them so well. So again, that's uh, one of the first encouraging signs. It just showed what the potential was of, of the, these fields. And these, I think these are the, um, the field ants, the, the yellow ants. And this is, uh, I took this a year or two ago. This is again one of the paddocks. Before it was just a mass of grass. Now this is wild carrot that's growing and it's been given a chance. And it was quite surprising where it all came from because there wasn't much before. And uh, it, it just suddenly appeared several acres of it, which is, uh, which is rather nice. Some of the other things that are growing there now, mainly, mainly common meadow plants, but again, the, the title of this is about chalk grassland and um, you, you get um, common and rare plants, but in the main, we're seeing the common ones now, but one or two more unusual species are also moving in. So this is the, the oxide daisy that I'm sure you're familiar with. These are appearing in greater numbers every year. This is a little plant called uh, greater yellow rattle, which is a semi-parasite semi and it's very good because it, um, it weakens the, the coarse grass and gives other plants a chance to, 
starts to spread. So we're very pleased to see that there. And some of this has been introduced, but um, it's, it's good, a good plant to have on the grassland. This is greater knapweed that was there originally, but we're seeing more and more of this now in the, in the paddocks. And field scabious, um, over, over one side of one of the paddocks is a very nice colony of this now, which is spreading year by year. Ladies bed straw, which is, um, again, it's a classic chalk grassland plant, um, just appeared after, after a year or two's grazing. It's called bed straw because uh, centuries ago it was um, actually used to stuff pillows and mattresses and also strewn on the floor in cottages because it has a very sweet smell when it's dry. But obviously there's more, more modern equivalents now that people prefer to, uh, prefer to use. And we're also delighted we're getting um, orchids now appearing. This is a pyramidal orchid which um, seem to be doing well and spreading. The uh, pyramidal orchids uh, like most orchids, the seed is like dust and it blows around in the wind. So just because it's appeared there didn't mean to say the seed was there all the time. It could have arrived, but um, very nice to see that. So we've had we've got pyramidal orchids growing, and um, you know, which is a sign of improving grassland. Now, so they're the two paddocks that we've had a quick look at. Around the paddocks, we've got two areas. The area in white um, is public access. So the public can come in down here in the south if they want, or they can come in over here, um, over here, sorry, um, and they walk around. And it's been very good during lockdown because more and more people have found the site and they can enjoy it, but without actually going into the, the grazing areas or the, this area here, which is in green. And that is a restricted access area. And some of them, most exciting and interesting things that have been happening in the reserve have been happening in the restricted access area. But when we can get back to having walks, then obviously we can take members and, uh, and the public round to show them what, what's going on there. But um, you might say, why restrict access? Well, it's a very good reason. It's not just to keep people out for the sake of it. We have five ponds there. And you may know dogs um, love ponds and they will jump in and splash around in a pond and it doesn't do the ecology of the pond very much so it ensures that the ponds can develop naturally and the water there is, uh, is crystal clear which I have to say for Surrey as a whole is not that common because most uh, lakes and ponds are either used for fishing or for uh, general recreational use and the water tends to be quite cloudy but we've got some really clear water and uh, so a very nice aquatic environment is developing. We've also got what we call hibernacular, which is a posh name for somewhere for animals and invertebrates to hibernate. And we've built those. And again, they're, they're quite um, sensitive to disturbance. So, and, and again, they do need to be you know, protected from um, curious um, people wondering what they are and pulling bits off them. We've also got corrugated iron refuges, which sheets of corrugated iron and Steve has been running the, the project there and they're used for basically um, really anything that wants to use them. Ants love them, but we're getting uh, grass snakes, uh, lizards, uh, small mammals, and uh, together with the high binacular, they're, they're proving to improve the uh, uh, biodiversity of this area quite significantly. But also very important, uh, nesting birds. Uh, we get um, white throats and one or two summer visitors nesting in, in bramble thickets, but also there's a lot of skylarks um, that nest in the paddocks and in this private area. And again, it's very important that they suffer minimal disturbance. So again, I think it's, a, it's um, the reserve is quite nicely shared out between the public and, and nature. Right, here's one of the ponds that the developers built for us. Uh, needed a little bit of work because it was being invaded by grass, but we've got it into quite a good state now. And this is early in the year, but later on the uh, the, the reeds and the lilies spread and it looks really good. And we've had um, some newts in these ponds that have uh, just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, a little bit of frog spawn, a pair of toads appeared one year. And uh, interestingly, dragonflies do very well um, in, in them. And, uh, that's one of the reasons we put reeds in because the dragonfly larvae live for about three to four years, I believe, um, certainly the larger dragonflies, and then they will crawl up a stem and the dragonfly itself will 
um, emerge from, I think this is uh, called an exuvia. Steve will know if that's the right word, is it? Exuvia, this, this case? Yes, that's right, Peter. Yeah, Thank exuvia. you. Exuvia. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's rather like a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis, uh, but the exuvia is left on the stem of the uh, of the reed, and this one here I suspect is a, a different species of um, dragonfly, much smaller, it may even be a, a damselfly. I don't know. Uh, here are some pictures of the dragonflies that I've taken there. This is a, a broad-bodied chaser. I hope I've got these right. I'm not an expert on dragonflies, but that's a broad-bodied chaser. That's right. That is a broad-bodied chaser. Yeah. Yeah. This one, southern hawker? Um, that's that's actually an emperor. An emperor, thank you. I, next yeah. time I give this presentation, I'll change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but it, but it, by the look of it, it's laying an egg, um, which uses how they, they, they lay their eggs on vegetation. Here, um, there's actually a water boatman. I didn't notice that until I looked at the picture at home. And uh, a couple of water snails over here. So yeah, this, this pond is doing really well. And common data, Steve? Yep, common data. Good, got that one right, thank you. So yeah, and I imagine you've seen lots of others you've been able to identify as well, which I haven't, but um, certainly come mid, mid and late summer, you can see them there all the time. This is a large pond, one of the largest that the de developer left us. Again, needed a bit of work. This is after it was cleared out during the winter, but it develops very nicely during the summer. And in fact, the vegetation is now quite dense there and we need to um, do some management later this autumn. But uh, this is what it was, oops, what it was like. You can see the, the frog spawn that um, appeared, which is very nice. Um, we do have a heron and crows that um, seem to enjoy eating tadpoles. So there's a bit of a battle going on between the, the among the wildlife. But um, so it's, it's another good sign of the fact that this is doing very well. And that's the same pond later on in the year. Um, you say, just shaving up very nicely and uh, very, very pleased with that. And over in the background, this is the grazing paddock here. So the cattle can come up to that fence and then this is all restricted access for the volunteers and Surrey Wildlife Trust staff. This is, um, We've got, there's one very small pond there that um, plant called starfruit that you may have heard of. It's very, it's very rare and it's doing splendidly there now and it's actually formed a, a reservoir for nationally for seed if anybody needs it. There's only about two sites in the country where this, this grows and it seems to have uh, found a home where it's very happy at uh, Priest Hill. It's called a starfruit because if you look at the fruits here, the seed pods are all in the shape of stars. It has these three petaled flowers. Right. And also, um, three years ago, uh, we were very fortunate in that the Wildlife Trust obtained a grant from Tesco to produce a, a much larger pond that would be open to the public for pond dipping for school parties. And uh, we were given £10,000 for construction, and that included ponds, fencing, again to keep dogs out, and uh, also a public access dipping platform. And I've got some photos of the pond as it was being constructed. So this is the, the area we decided on. You can see these posts here and one here. So we staked out where we wanted it to go. And then we had uh, some excellent contractors. I think they're called Groundwork or Groundworks or something like that. But um, they came in and did a very good job. So they had a, a digger and a dumper. And you can see here they've gone down through the th fairly thin layer of topsoil into the chalk. And the pond was specified to be a metre deep, so they went down significantly deeper than that into the chalk. And then, so that's the pond, um, the, the profile in the chalk. And then the actual lining of it to make it waterproof, because clearly on chalk, you, you get very little surface water for obvious reasons. It's very porous and water just runs straight away. So the first thing they did was, uh, and I was surprised, there were four different layers. They put down this black plastic I wasn't sure what the reason for that was. It might have been a waterproof liner, but then this is rather like fiberglass, and this stops flints and so on coming up through and damaging the, the waterproof liner itself. So there are two layers went in to start with. And then along came this truck with what looks like rolls of carpet. And in fact, this is called bentonite matting. Bentonite is a clay that expands by about 14 times when you wet it. Then they, they stitch clay in between two layers of matting. This is then laid down 
on the pond and then it expands and it makes a waterproof layer. So this is the bentonite matting going down on top of the other two layers. And it's not finished there because having got the bentonite matting down, there's um, clay was then put on top of the bentonite matting and that keeps weight on it, which ensures a, a good watertight seal. And having built the pond, so then built a dipping platform for school parties and such like. Very strong, very sturdy, some massive timbers there. This is a, under construction. That's the platform as completed. And this is the grand, grand opening, a hose pipe starting to, uh, to fill, the, fill the pond. I managed to capture that moment on camera. And uh, so it took a long time to fill, but uh, it's nearly full there. But after the, a wet winter, such as we've had, it's come up virtually to the top. Um, so that was, uh, that was a pond, very pleased to have that. It's a great asset to the site and grateful to Tesco for doing that and also for the, the trust for winning the, the, the grant. Right. Um, I mentioned earlier the hibernaculum. So this, this is, um, goes back a few years when we constructed a couple of these. Uh, this is quite an elaborate one. It's a, of Hilton Hotel for small creatures. So we dug a pit. These were pallets that were donated by the developers who built the houses. And we put those in the pit like this, and then on top um, of them, but without filling in these gaps, we put bricks and uh, bits of wood, bits of board and so on, but left holes for small creatures to go in and out. And we're talking about uh, lizards, grass snakes, Voles, field mice, frogs, um, uh, somewhere for them to either hibernate or to live during the winter. And we topped it off with turf. And there we are, um, the, uh, the volunteers. And some of you may know Rachel, who was the, the ranger at the time. And um, that was it. So nature has now taken over and the turf has grown down. And But you, we don't know what's living there because we'd have to take it apart to find out that there's um, numerous little runs that lead into it and small holes. So it's, they're certainly being used, which is good. And then these are the, uh, the reptile tins. Steve looks after these. I, I believe uh, there's 24 of them and uh, part of the Surrey Amphibian Reptile Group. You, you monitor for them, I believe, Steve. And uh, That's you... right. Yeah, I, I uh, check the tins about once a month um, throughout the um, from spring through to autumn um, and there are as you say 24 of these tins dotted around the uh, the site yeah so uh, but again this is all creating habitat because as, as as it was before apart from a few leftover bricks it was just a grass field but this increases by biodiversity immensely just something as simple as some corrugated iron tins so it's, it's definitely worth doing anywhere but again this is because they'd be disturbed if people were allowed in. Um, they, uh, this is why they're really only in the restricted access areas. We have blackthorn growing along one side, which is a great asset. Black, blackthorn is the food plant of the caterpillar of the um, uh, brown, um, brown hair streak. So I forgot the name for a minute, the brown hair streak butterfly. But um, the thing is, the butterflies like to lay their eggs on new growth, whereas this is mature hedge. So part of the maintenance schedule, we scull up the blackthorn hedge. So here we've cut back the old growth. This then forms new shoots around there. And then the brown hair streaks will lay their eggs on the, on the new growth. And just by way of illustration, that is what black brown hair streak eggs look like. And you really need to go out in winter uh, very tiny, but once you get your eye in, um, we, we find you can spot them quite easily, and they will uh, they'll be laid by a female in the, uh, in the in the late summer over winter, and then they hatch, uh, I believe, in a few months, in a few weeks' time, hopefully. This is a brown hair streak. Um, there's been sightings of them, not that many at Priest Hill, but the good thing is we've we've found them there, and brown hair streaks uh, are regarded as an uncommon butterfly, but they do tend to stay near the top of what is called a master tree. And then they just come down to lay the eggs. 
well, the females come down. So not an easy butterfly to spot, but yes, they, they're there and we've, we've found them, seen them, so that's really good. Um, the uh, butterfly recording at Priest Hill is very well organised in, in association with butterfly conservation and um, we've got a um, volunteer who regularly re records there and I think Steve, you're a backup, I think, when he's on holiday. And, That's right, um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, overall, over six years there, seven years, we found uh, 23 species have been recorded. Um, I'm not, not going to give the numbers um, because there's lots of ifs and, ifs and buts about the year and uh, what a sighting means, but basically the three common ones are meadow brown, common blue and small heath. The rarest are the green hair streak, the brown hair streak, which I've mentioned, and painted lady. And painted lady, um, I think primarily migrants, and some years you get an absolute um, overwhelming uh, cloud of painted ladies coming across the channel and then other years not too many. There's no particular order to those in the middle, uh, but um, one notable one is small blue, which I talk about. It is quite a rare butterfly, but um, for reasons I'll explain, we see quite a lot at Priest Hill. Right, management of the scrapes. Uh, yes, the scrapes are one of the big assets of the uh, reserve. Uh, so some of them, we've just let them go. Natural colonisation to basically see what arrives. And... Um, some of, it is, some of the wildflowers, this is wild mignonette, this one here, and it's quite a lot of that is appearing. Uh, Colts a very nice plant, unusual in that the flowers are out now. So if you go to Priest Hill now, you'll see Colts foot on the, on the scrapes. And then when the flowers have died back, the leaves come out in a couple of months time. So it's the other way around compared with many plants. Rose Bay Willow Herb, you may be familiar with, that's uh, quite, um, opportunist that will pop up anywhere that does well there this is herb robert unusual um unusual shape unusual leaf color uh, i think this is drought stress that's made it like this it should be green and much bushier but i took that photo because it was uh, such an unusual looking form this is narrow leaved ragwort you may be familiar with common ragwort which is a bit of a nuisance to livestock this is narrow leaved ragwort um, it arrived out of the blue. It's, uh, it's a migrant from southern Europe that came across the channel 25, 30 years ago and is slowly spreading, but uh, we're very pleased to see this pop up. And you can see the narrow leaves, hence the, hence the name. White Campion, which is quite a common one. Bird's foot trefoil, no, another good chalk-loving plant. Um, this is an interesting one. This is sticky groundsel. Um, you, familiar with grounds perhaps in, in, in your garden as a weed. This is uh, an, a less common version called sticky grounds. It's sticky to the touch and you can see the leaves. They've got this sort of misty gray appearance and they're all um, slightly sticky, covered in sticky hairs. So that found the chalk very quickly and uh, found it to its liking. Again, it can't take much competition, so it does need to be on its own. Um, this is probably only, only of interest to botanists. This is the umbilate hawkweed, but it's uh, very rare in this part of Surrey. It's um, found on the heathlands over to the west, but it suddenly appeared on one of these scrapes. And uh, very distinctive. These little spiky bits you can see on the fruit, uh, on, on, on the flower heads are um, the bracts and they stick out at an angle, which is, uh, makes it very distinctive to identify. This is Scots pine. Uh, the, the parent, uh, there are a few of these, the parent is over the road in somebody's garden. What is unusual is that Scots pine is really known as a plant of acid soils, peaty soils, sandy soils on, on heathland and in, in Scotland, but um, it seems very much at home on bare chalk, which is quite remarkable. It shows how adaptable some plants can be. Rowan, um, again, I'm not sure where that arrived from, but uh, a lot of these are wind, windborne seeds, and so that's how they got there. But Rowan is certainly not windborne, probably bird's son. That's the, uh, another name, is, of course, is mountain ash. Uh, this is fox and cubs. It's not native, but um, probably not a garden escape. It's uh, one of the composites of the dandelion like flowers. That makes a nice splash of colour. Uh, we also uh, very pleasantly surprised to see some orchids appear. This is common spotted orchid. This is the white hellebrine, which grew on the site of the old groundsman's house, I think. It's very nice to see. 
and the bee orchid root. At the one end of the scrapes on the Banstead Road, uh, it was one or two years ago, about 70 of these appeared in flower. And what's interesting is that these must have germinated from the dust-like seed, which means that from being sown or from arriving there to flowering, uh, it was only about um, four or five years. Whereas some, some orchids can take up to 10 years to flower, but the bee orchids come and go very quickly. So we, we hope the colony survives. There are some nuisance plants, I'm afraid. Uh, this is goat willow or pussy willow. Uh, if there's a parent nearby, they will spread all over the scrape and we spend uh, quite a bit of time, uh, volunteers digging these out. This is silver birch, another menace that loves bear chalk. And the worst of all, oh no, this isn't the worst of all, this is sycamore, this is not good, but it's not the worst of all. Um, so we, but drought often takes care of these if it gets too dry. And then the worst of all is buddleia, um, which is a plant that loves bare ground. It never invades grassland, but it just likes cracks in masonry, you'll see it on railway bridges, and it just loves the chalk scrape. So we've removed all the parent plants, and we now just have the, um, the scrapes with a few buddleia seeding, seedlings. We're still picking them out after five years, to be honest. So maybe it's seed that's in the, in the chalk, I don't know, but it will take over. Um, and we'll lose the scrapes completely. And sometimes when I'm pulling them out, a member of the public will say, what are you doing? And I say, I'm pulling out buddleia. And they say, well, isn't that good for butterflies? Well, the answer is yes, but we'll just have nothing but buddleia. So we try to uh, give, um, give space for other things. So we have some garden escapes that appeared. Um, some, these are from people's gardens, basically, not um, wildflowers, but they, uh, they came on there. And this is called sea buckthorn, which is unusual inland. It's mainly found on the coast, as its name suggests. But uh, there is a parent plant somewhere away, and this must be bird sown. This is garden lavender. Um, again, it, uh, it, it does self-seed, and some popped up on one of the scrapes, and it's still there, doing quite well year after year. Pampas grass. Uh, have to be careful with it. It's very attractive but it can be a nuisance. So we do occasionally dig some of these out, but there's probably about half a dozen plants at the moment. And um, yeah, I think it adds to the reserve, but as I say, it needs keeping an eye on. This is Spurge or Euphorbia. Uh, it's a, again, it's a garden variety. The, um, yeah. uh, but uh, again, all, all the Euphorbias have a milky sap that is quite poisonous. So you need to be careful handling that. This is Red Valerian. Again, it's, Loves bare ground. If you go down to Cornwall and the West Country or Wales, you'll see this all over the walls and um, on, on the rocks everywhere. But uh, it, it's, it's found as a garden plant around here. California poppy or a sculpture is its other name. This has just popped up in one place. It's perennial, so we see this every year. And snapdragon, peach leaf bellflower, very attractive, but it can become quite invasive. So we do keep an eye on that. An atlas poppy. This is a perennial poppy, unlike a lot of poppies which are annual. And you see the long pods which and the and the orange flowers which make it easy to identify. It's Cornelian cherry. This is self-sown from a parent on the site. Uh, it's almost unheard of in Surrey as a self-sown plant. So although it's not native, it's very good for early nectar for bees and insects, and it produces small cherries later in the year. Right. Now, one of the introductions we've done to the scrapes is kidney vetch. Kidney vetch is the food plant of the caterpillar of the small blue butterfly, and efforts are made throughout all, all along the downs to create scrapes to try and encourage the small blue. So we've done justice at, um, at Priest Hill. So this is what uh, the scrape by the band scrapes by the Bannisted Road looked like in 2014. This is what they look like in 2015, a bit of vegetation showing. 2016, even greener, but by this time we'd introduced kidney vetch seed from Howell Hill, a nearby wildlife trust reserve. And this is what it looked like in 2018. It's got a magnificent show of, um, of kidney vetch. And we did the same with another scrape nearby. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'll just show you. This is what kidney vetch looks like if, if you've not seen it up, up front but it has no problem at all growing on bare chalk. And I think it has root nodules that store nitrogen, which is how it can survive in this very harsh environment that most things struggle with. 
So this is another scrape where we seeded kidney vetch. This is 2014 and jump on four years. This is 2018. And this has actually created a thriving population of small blue, blood, small blue butterflies. And also it produced so much seed that uh, it's now a donor site for um, various other butterfly um, conservation projects such as uh, Brilliant Butterflies and the, um, the uh, project that Fiona Haynes led. Um, I've forgotten the name of it, Steve. Can you remind me? The, the yeah, down... it, was, it was actually just called the Small Blue Project. The Small Blue Project, yeah. yeah. So, we, so Priest is now donating seed. And this is what it's all about. This is a small blue. It's very small. Uh, not very blue, actually, but um, Priest Hill is a good place to see them in good first two weeks in June, or, probably, or last week in May, first two weeks in June are a good time to go there. Some of the seed that we brought in from Priest, sorry, from Howell Hill actually had some passengers, and this is fairy flax, these little white dots here, another good chalk-loving plant that can only cope if there's not much competition, that's doing, their, do, doing well at, at Priest Hill. Um, some more greater yellow rattle, uh, which arrived there. Not normally found outside grassland, but it seems quite happy on the chalk. And uh, I'd say a few words now about the Rare Plants Project. The, there are a lot of, well, a number of rare plants in Surrey that really need fairly sparse chalk soil and can't cope with competition. So Priest Hill provided the obvious place to introduce some of these rare plants. And the purpose of this was to create a kind of nursery. It would be a seed bank uh, for uh, saving some of these plants, which were in very vulnerable sites. And uh, in fact, two of those sites have already been lost. So Priest Hill is one of the few sites in Surrey where we have these plants. So this bank was prepared by um, digging away all that coarse chalk. Uh, there are two heaps here. This is fine chalk and this is fine soil from the site and they were mixed 50-50 and spread along the bank like this. That house brick shows you the depth, about two, two and a half inches. And then this was the seed bed for the uh, rare plants. So what we have growing there, and it's been very successful, this is wild candy tuft, which similar to the candy tuft in the garden, but it grows in just one other place in Surrey. Uh, this is cut leaf germander, nationally extremely rare. Um, it was, it was lost from its other site where I collected the seed. Um, and this was a Schedule 8 plant, by the way, and permission was obtained from Wildlife Trust and Natural England to collect and sow the seed. So we've got a good colony of that there now, ready to um, back up other sites. So that's been lost from its other site. This is Basil Time, one or two other sites in Surrey. It's now doing very well at Priest Hill. White Mullane, you may know the large Great Mullane, but this is the white version. It's a bare chalk specialist, very few of these in Surrey now, just half a dozen sites, but it uh, seems very happy on the bank. This is broadleaf cudweed. Nationally, um, again, it's another Schedule 8 plant that we obtained permission. You could easily walk past it. It's very, um, well, not, not at all um, obvious when you walk there, and, um, but it's, it's a nice little plant, and this is doing well. Uh, about three sites nationally. Um, Free still is the fourth site doing well. And another one, this is called the hairy rock cress. This is what it looks like, not easy to photograph. So this is a close up of what it looks like. And it was growing on Banstead Downs and that's where the seed came from, but that's been lost now. So this is really a conservation exercise, but also people that want to see some of our rare chalk plants can go to Priest Hill. This is an um, unusual one. You're familiar with the Scarlet Pimpernel, or the red form. This is the blue form. Uh, I think there's just one other site in Surrey, and it's doing very well again at uh, Priest Hill. It's a, it's a variant, not a different species, it's just a variant. Birds at Priest Hill. Uh, we've got one of the, um, of the volunteers keeps a log of birds, and these are some of the birds that we've um, recorded there. Some are winter visitors, some breed, some just pass through, but some of note, there's grasshopper warbler. It's a rare summer visitor, ring oozel. Uh, that passes through on its way to upland areas, the Lake Districts and um, Wales and Scotland. Uh, Windchat is a nice one to see. Um, woodcock has been spotted. Jack snipe is much less common than the common snipe. Um, but again, I won't go through them all, but um, 
It's not nice birds there, and um, obviously there's some common ones that I haven't, haven't logged there, but these are just the notable ones. White throats breed on the site, skylarks certainly breed. Um, I'm not sure if black caps breed. Steve, I don't know any other birds that we've got on that list, but um, yeah. I suspect black caps do do breed maybe on the on the southern border right. the site near that blackthorn hedge. Okay. Um, I've certainly seen them. Uh, I've heard them singing, um, but yeah. I've not actually seen a nest yet. Okay, right. There's some pictures of birds. These are all taken at Priest Hill. Is a green woodpecker making rather aggressively making a point by the look of it, but uh, you don't normally see them perched in a tree like that. This is uh, a stone chat. Normally up to half a dozen of these spend the winter there, but they, they move on to breed somewhere else. Meadow pipit, um, again, these appear from time to time, but as far as I know, they don't, um, they don't breed there. Um, so it's nice to see them. Uh, kestrel, see those year round. Um, we have actually put up a kestrel nesting box in one of the trees, hopefully they will breed. Wheat ear passing through on passage. Again, they're heading for the north and west of the country. Common red start, again, um, passing through, but um, seen there from time to time. Common white throat, they, they certainly breed. We've got bramble patches there and they just love isolated bramble patches. Um, geology is interesting. Um, this is, um, the boundary of the site, site boundary. The green is the chalk and the blue is one patch of thanet sand. And uh, it just overlaps the boundary of the reserve. Now thanet sand originally covered this whole area, but it's been weathered away just to expose the chalk. But Steve actually dug a test pit to see if it, the geology map was accurate. And it was, and this, this is thanet sand. So the plan later on when we're released from lockdown is to actually create a sand scrape on the reserve and the purpose of this would be to attract solitary bees which just love bare sand um, so it's quite an exciting project and we're looking forward to get started on that. Um, volunteering at Priest Hill, um, yep yeah, we've um, when Surrey Wildlife Trust uh, has uh, handed over much of the work now to the volunteers and uh, every First Monday in the month, we have a, a work party and we welcome new, um, new volunteers to join us. Uh, it's 10 o'clock on the first Monday in the month, we meet and work through to about three o'clock. And these are the volunteers. Um, we just installed that sign actually, uh, said Priest Hill Nature Reserve. So yeah, we're happy, happy band as you can see, and it's, it's always good to meet up. So um, yes, if uh, any of you feel so inclined you know, to do join us, that would be great. And that's the end of the presentation. So Steve and I will take questions now and I shall stop screen sharing. Thank you very much, Keith. That was really fascinating. I hope everybody's enjoyed that. And what I found interesting is the um, amazing biodiversity on the site um, with all the different species, but also not just biodiversity, but abundance as well, which is beautiful to see with or the kidney vetch and how that's helping the small blue. And um, that's also, you know, helping connect sites up across the landscape as well. So um, I particularly liked the, um, the hibernaculum and all the little trails into it. I found that really interesting um, and such beautiful pictures. So thank you very much, Peter. So um, does anybody have any questions for Peter or Stephen? You can either write it in the chat or ask it. Please feel free to unmute yourselves. I've got a question um, while we're waiting. Let's see if anybody else has one. Um, what you mentioned the ant hills right at the beginning. I found that quite interesting. And I want to, I want to, I do you know why ant hills are a good sign and what, what do they show? Well, I mean, one 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 thing that's um appreciates having the ants there are the green woodpeckers so Peter had a photo of the green woodpecker and we see them very regularly on the site so um, those ant hills it's the yellow meadow ant and um, green woodpeckers just just love um, go, going down they've got a very long tongue so they can go down and uh, they've got little hooks on the end so they can put their tongue down into the ant hill and they just hook 
an ant, pull it out and uh, and uh, eat it. So um, yeah, that's 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 one that's one particular creature that likes it. And yeah. I think it's uh, it's probably it's it's probably good for other things as well. Um, but um, you know, there's a lot kind of goes on at the low level. I think in terms of you know the biodiversity of the site. And you know, as humans, we tend to what see all of the sort of big, bigger creatures, the more showy creatures. But there's a lot kind of going on underneath. Um, there's a lot of interactions happening between insects that we're just not really aware of. Yes, yeah, so that's right. I mean, I think as you say, Steve, they're uh, just a, a good sign of biodiversity, and many of the things, as you say, that we don't think about are there. Um, as, as part of that uh, that whole network of biodiversity, I mean, earthworms are a very good example. Uh, exactly. But we've never never even looked or thought about earthworms, but I'm sure there's plenty there, along with the ants, and I'm sure there's lots of lots of other things. Um, I mean, I didn't mention grasshoppers. There's a good population of grasshoppers that appear in the summer, and uh, I presume they overwinter underground. Steve, is that right? As a part of this chain? Yeah, they tend to grasshoppers. They 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 tend to. Um lay their eggs into the into the soil and they'll just overwinter there there's also there's a related creature called a bush cricket um and they lay their eggs into stems of plants so i don't know if you are aware of bush crickets but the females have a long kind of stick-like structure at the back of the abdomen which is called an ovipositor um and um they can insert that ovipositor into the stem of a plant and lay an egg there and then it will just probably overwinter as an egg and then hatch out as a larvae in the early spring. Um, yeah, so there is there is quite an interesting selection of um, these orthoptera as they call the grasshoppers, uh, grasshoppers and crickets. And um, I, I do some surveying of, of, of orthoptera in the Epsom area and I found a grasshopper at um, a priest hill called a, a lesser marsh grasshopper. And it's the only site in, in Epsom and Yule uh, that I've seen it. Um, so, so that's good. And it's just got there on, on its own. It could have been a residual uh, population that was there, um, you know, when it was just rough grassland and it sort of hung on. But now it's, it's with the, the management we're doing and the grazing, it's, uh, it's doing very well. Yeah. There really must be thousands of species in total would include, include all the insects and invertebrates. Mm. It? Yeah, I'm sure you're right, yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions come in on the chat. Um, so Virginia has asked, how are the ponds fed? Is it just natural rainfall? If so, do they go dry in the summer? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, it, it is natural rainfall because there's no surface water to speak of in the chalk. It's just very, very few rivers flow through it. So it does rely on rainfall to fill them up. At the end of the each winter, well, they had one dry winter, but at the end of each winter, they're brim full and they're, they're brim full now. But um, what we found to start with, there were initial problems because of the, the design of them. The, in order to create a natural look, the um, developer had um, pushed back some of the soil that uh, they'd taken out and um, just to blend in with the meadow land on the bank. And that caused a problem because of uh, a wicking effect. Water was creeping up into the grass in the way, so we, we broke that link. But um, the, the other issue was that in order that the, um, the soil that he, he pushed back in and the stones and it didn't puncture the lining, he put in what's called geotextile, which is rather like a canvassy material. And so we, whilst we cleared the vegetation around the edge, uh, this geotextile was acting as a wick. So what we did, we have actually cut the collar away um, all around the ponds now, and that exposes um, a plastic liner underneath. And the, where, where the, we now just have a plastic liner rather than soil, grass, and this geotextile, the evaporation is minimal. And um, I think in the main, unless we have an extremely dry summer, the ponds will hold water. So it, um, the, the large pond, which has probably got too much vegetation in it, that needs managing because the more vegetation you have, the greater the transpiration and the faster the loss of water. And it's got some shallow banks, but um, yeah, yes, so we've, we've got to a situation now where the ponds have water all the year round. And um, like all ponds, they do need managing, but I think we're fairly happy with them, aren't we, Steve? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and we've got a, a bit of a variation as well. So um, the, the pond that you, you showed um, a photo of, the, I think it was where the, um, the uh, emperor dragonfly was, uh, was taken. Um, that one, we totally removed the, the geotextile liner. Um, and so that, that really does keep water the whole year round now, doesn't it? Mm. Um, we've got other ones because we didn't really want to, we wanted to have a little bit of a variety. So we've got other ones where we've removed some of the geotextile liner, but we still, still left some in there. Um, and um, last summer was particularly dry. Um, I don't know if you remember, but last May there was, I think it was the lowest rainfall on record uh, and uh, there were some very hot spells. So one, of the, one or two of the ponds did actually dry out, the ones that still had more geotextile liner in them. But um, it's nice to have a little bit of variety, really, isn't it? So um, that's what we're, we're trying to do is to, is to, you know, is to get um, a, a, variety of, a variety of ponds there, which will give us sort of different, different sorts of results through, the, um, you know, through the, the different kinds of summers that we're getting. Thank you. Um, and I'll just move because we've got a few more questions popping into the chat. Um, Gillian has asked, a lot of cherry trees have been cleared. Is this an ongoing part of the plan to limit the trees on the site? Um, no, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's creating a balance. Yes, uh, a lot of cherry trees have been cleared, but in the main they were suckers. We're, we're not talking about large mature cherries. And the problem is they do spread. So the uh, one of the key objectives there is, is chalk grassland, hence the title of, the, of this talk. And it's a question of keeping some cherry and also some patch, patches of bramble and, and so on, but um, keeping enough open land, open grassland to, to fit in with what we think is reasonable. So that's the reason that the cherries are being cleared. Thank you. Um, and a question from Carol. Um, I understand that there are some plans to expand Howell Hill and link it up to Priest Hill. Can you tell us any more about that? <laughs> yes. Um, in fact, uh, Steve and I went to a meeting a week or so ago with uh, some of the people from the Trust and Surrey County Council um, who are in, in, involved in, in this. So what we have is... We have Priest Hill and um, Howell Hill and Northy Fields in between the two. And Northy Fields, uh, some of you I'm sure know Northy Fields, they're owned by Surrey County Council and they're rented out to a farmer who um, has been um, growing a crop. I mean, I, I have to say, not that intensively. I, I get the feeling that um, he's not making a great deal of money out of it or he's not paying a great deal of rent. So they're underused as agricultural land. And the proposal um, was uh, made that some good use could be made of these to link up the two nature reserves. And certainly the uh, Surrey County Council seem um, quite amenable to um, creating some kind of a, uh, a route between the two nature reserves and uh, not um, hopefully there, there'd be no housing development being proposed there. Uh, we have talked about planting shrubs there, hedge hedgerows, to create a wildlife corridor between the two because you can get, there's just the Banstead Road basically that separates the fields from, from one another. Um, Chris Grayling, you, you may know, first came up with this suggestion and he thought about planting trees there, but Surrey is very well wooded and I don't think um, lots of trees we we'll actually do a lot of good there. But so, yes, uh, so what's happening is there'll be a, a site meeting in a few weeks time, hopefully, and we need to look at the potential and the best management plan for these fields. Apart from creating a link, the fields themselves, the arable fields have hosted a whole range of rare arable plants in the past. And the farmer hopefully has now agreed to not spray the margins and we'll be monitoring them to see what actually comes up because there are rare poppies there. There are poppies called the rough poppy and the prickly poppy, which are excessive, exceedingly rare in Surrey now. And we're hoping some of those will reappear uh, with the cessation of spraying. Um, and also it may be that the fields themselves will be tilled, but not actually cultivated to see what happens. But um, it's, I mean, it's, uh, 
it's, it's still an unknown area. It's, it's not exactly, I'm sure you've heard of uh, rewilding, which is going on at NEP. This isn't actually rewilding, but it's letting uh, cultivated land revert up to a point to where it wants to go. So, um, but there's no firm plan at the moment, but this hopefully will also protect it from development and increase biodiversity. Thank you. And I think um, I've heard one of you mention before that there has been some successes with um, species that have moved from Priest Hill to Howe Hill or back the other way. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, um, they have. The it was it was uh, originally from Howe Hill to Priest Hill, and that's how in, how that's how the kidney vetch got there because the kidney vetch was growing at Priest Hill and we took it over there. In fact, in the main, what was done, it wasn't seed that was collected. There's a technique um, called green, collect green hay. And basically you wait until midsummer when a lot of the plants have set seed and then you harvest the hay with the plants and the seed in them. And then you just strew that hay, over, in this case, over the chalk scrapes. You throw it off the back of a wagon, um, spread it with a rake and uh, also the, the hay actually forms a mulch for the seeds. And so the seeds are given a good start in life because there's something protecting them from drying out. And so that was how it was started. But since that happened, we've given it a helping hand and we collect seed and we're spreading it out to more scrapes now. Um, but uh, the management plan actually designated certain scrapes for um, introductions and other scrapes just to see what would happen. And so we, we've got a mixture, so we're, we're monitoring both kinds, but the, the kidney vetch has been, and, and the other plants. And I, th I think the um, the small blue butterfly made its way from Howell Hill uh, over to Priest Hill. Once the kidney vetch became established, um, it was it's it was quite easy for it to 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 move that that small distance, because Howell Hill has um, has been one of the best sites in Surrey for small blue. There was very high numbers there in the early two thousands, and it's still doing quite well. Um, and then. Since uh, since it's moved over to Priest Hill, um, the the numbers have been doing very well there. 2018 and 2019, even last year, um, the, you know the numbers have got, gone up a lot. Um, so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's good to see it there. And then also, you know, Peter Peter sort of mentioned that there's this corridor that really goes through going south from Priest Hill over towards Epsom Downs. So um, quite close, really, to Priest Hill, you've got the golf course on Epsom Downs and there's, there's small blue there. Um, and then the middle of the golf, the middle of the race course has got some short scrapes that were created uh, with kidney vetch and the small blue there. And then Peter's also involved in the work at, at uh, Langley Vale Farm, you know, the, the Woodland Trust um, land now. Um, and um, so small blues be getting be becoming established at Langley Vale so it's it's nice that we've now got this kind of linkage going all the way through um, for the small blue butterfly. Yeah you must be on the bee lines network there as well I know it links all the way through to Guildford along the North Downs way and I know that butterfly conservation took the seed from Priest Hill and has uh, exactly yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I volunteered mm -hmm. with the Small Blue project. I mean, that finished uh, getting on for nearly two years ago now, but there's a continuation project. So we we um, we worked on creating these small scrapes um, across the North Downs, really. The, the section between Guildford going over towards Box Hill, um, where uh, the Small Blue wasn't present, but we created the conditions for uh, you know, for the butterfly, sowed kidney vetch seed, including some from Priest Hill. Um, and uh, so it's working very well. Um, oh, you know, I think it's a big success story. It's so important, that connect connectivity across the landscape. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just going back to the questions, um, Keith has asked, do you need to keep scraping the um, scrapes to avoid the soil from spreading? No, I um... We, we do very little by hand on the scrapes. And one, one of the points there is that um, you know, we've got four and a half acres of scrapes and it's, it's difficult to do anything manually except attack the invasive species that we don't want there. So no, there's no scrape, scraping at all. What we have noticed, which is interesting, is that when the scrapes were created 
five, six years ago now. Uh, it was down to chalk bedrock and it was very, a very hard surface. The frost has broken up the chalk and in, in a sense it's doing a lot of our work for us because there's a nice sort of crumb structure slowly appearing year after year, which means that we don't have to do a lot of work there. And uh, just in terms of the, the kind of work the volunteers do, uh, there's a, a wonderful tool that you can use on, on, on chalk particularly called a tree popper. So it's just basically a lever really with a pair of jaws at the bottom. Um, and so I think Peter showed some of the plants which are a problem on the chalk scrapes. So in particular, silver birch is, is kind of very prolific there. But if you, if you go in with, with the tree popper, you can just get the, the silver birch seedlings when they're you know, maybe only foot 18 inches high and you can just pop them out very quickly. Um, and so that stops the chalk scrapes from really just scrubbing up and you know, becoming sort of secondary woodland eventually. Um, and also when you, when you pop, what you do is to pull the, the, the sapling out completely by its roots. Uh, so it, it doesn't regrow. And also it actually disturbs the soil a little bit. So you just, it does tend to maintain this little bit of open structure that you get um, you know, on, the, on the bare chalk. Uh, which then makes it easier for uh, seeds of, uh, you know, wildflowers um, to be able to then get established more. Thank you. Is it quite hard to um, dig into the chalk? It looks like it might be very difficult. <laughs> I think if you wanted to dig a pit, it would be quite hard. But uh, if you just want to dig a seedling out, it is still quite crumbly, isn't it, Peter? So uh, it's quite, quite, quite straightforward. It is. I mean, what, what is interesting is uh, this is partly down to geology and partly down to um, the developer when he cleared the, the tarmac is that if you go over to the um, uh, east of the, sorry, the west of the site by the Rygate Road, you're down to bare chalk all around. But if you go over to the Banstead Road, then down the, the scrape, there were five tennis courts there that went down in a series of steps. There's subsoil there. And the very bottom one um, is uh, quite a depth of subsoil. And so it's very interesting to see the contrast in the vegetation between what we've got on, on the other side by the Rygate Road and over there, because um, there's absolutely bare chalk. But here, because there's some subsoil, there's an awful lot of other plants are taking root, which wouldn't grow on the bare chalk. So, that's, um, where the, that's where the bee orchids are, isn't it? So yes, it um, they, they do seem to prefer a little bit of soil there. Thank you. Um, and I've, I've got a, a botanical question here. Um, uh, Ailsa says, very interesting talk. Thank you. I'm currently doing a diploma in botanical illustration and need to do a wildflower assignment. I would like to study the chalk grassland flowers. I live in West Clandon. Where would you recommend I go to see a good representation of flowers with my sketchbook? Hmm. West Clandon. Um, yes, that's, uh, I'm, I have to confess, I'm, I'm a Sutton person, so I don't know that area very well. There's a, there's a wonderful reserve there called Sheepleys, um, I think that's quite near West Clandon, and I certainly recommend a visit there, but anywhere... And Merrow Downs as well, I think. Merrow quite, Downs, yes, good point, quite, Steve, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Merrow Downs. Um, there's, a, there's a couple who, who do a lot with Surrey Botanical Society and Butterfly Conservation, um, the the Elsoms, um and they they do the butterfly transect at, uh, at Merrow Downs and uh, we we've had work parties there now with the small blue project um, so I remember there was quite good extensive areas of the chalk gra grassland there mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a lizard orchid um, one or two lizard orchids grow uh, mm -hmm. on Merrow Downs so there's some good stuff there yeah. I think the other point to make is that we, t we talk loosely about chalk grassland, but it's not um, a uniform environment. We're going back to the depth of soil, if you're on the scarp slope, if you go to Box Hill or Ranmore or Marrow, um, which I don't know, but where, where you've got thin soils on the scarp slope, you've got a totally different plant community um, in comparison with where the soil is deeper. And over this side of the county, um, some of you may have been to Happy Valley and Farthing Down which is over in the south of Croydon, which are lovely chalk grassland sites, but you've got deeper soils there and you get a totally different plant community and you get chalk plants there that you will not get on, um, on thin soils. So 
it's, it's a question of what sort of chalk plants and chalk grassland um, you, you want to home in on, uh, ideally a, a selection. Thank you. Um, hope that was helpful, um, Ailsa. Um, Virginia's got another question. Are there any other projects in conjunction with developers ongoing? Do you see this being something of importance in the future, bearing in mind restrictions on spare land in Surrey? I'm, I'm personally not aware of any. I think, uh, I have to say, I, as far as Priest Hill is concerned, I, I think it was just the right time and we're all exceptionally lucky for that to happen because I think there's much more pressure now on housing, uh, on, on local authorities to designate land for housing. And it may well be that there'd be more pressure to um, have given planning permission for housing on, on Priest Hill. But um, no, personally, I, I don't know of any, any other initiatives. I don't know if you do, Steve. No, I, I know that, uh, I think the Trust are very, uh, very proud of what's happened with Priest Hill. And I think it's a good example. So they, they may have some some other, you know, their planning section yeah. may have something in the pipeline, but I, I'm, I'm not, not sorry, I'm not an expert on it at all, but um there's a new law that's coming in called biodiversity net gain, which developers will have to ensure that they do get an actual a gain for nature rather than uh you know reduction in biodiversity. So that is something that they will have to adhere to by law and they are actually taking um, you know, action now to make sure that that will be possible. That so yes. not, you know, yeah. um, I think the minimum of 20% biodiversity net gain and or 10%, but developers that we've been speaking to are aiming to get more than that. So, um, yeah. So, yes, we definitely in the future, this will be something that they have to do more, more of in places like Priest Hill, which is really great news. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, uh, the Priest Hill model is, is, is a good one. It's, um, it can be a bit controversial. In, in other words, um, it, it's, uh, I think it's called a Section 106 agreement or planning gain. In other words, you give the developer permission to build some houses and in return they give you um, an open land that they would have liked to have built on, but they wouldn't have got the planning permission otherwise. And that's almost net gain, I suppose, in a way. But um, I think the problem is it was slightly controversial that arrangement I, I think it, it works well but some people say oh it's a bribe the developers given planning permission if they give something back well I think uh, you have to take a balanced view on that and if you look at uh, Priest Hill as, uh, as a model I, I think it, it is a good arrangement but um, uh, the opportunity may not arise again. Um, so has anybody got any more questions? I know at Priest Hill there was um, there was quite a lot of um, it was a sports ground before, wasn't it? So there was lots of old changing room blocks that were had been covered in graffiti and things. So um, yeah, yeah, huge improvement, attracting antisocial behaviour there. So it's a massive turnaround, and the fact that you've got such a thriving group of volunteers there now doing such amazing work, and you know you can really tell from your talk how much you love that place, and it's just lovely to hear. So thank you so much, and. Um, I've got another question coming in. Um, um, uh, many thanks to you all. A shame we couldn't make the walk in person, but this was the next best thing. Oh, thank you. Here, here, Virginia. Um, all the best, everybody. Um, so yes, so thank you very much. I, I'm not sure if anybody else has got any more questions, but I wanted to thank all the members for coming along this morning. Once again, we do apologise that we couldn't be in person out on site and we really look forward to the day when we can do our walks again um, for you guys. And um, yeah, just keep in touch and let us know if you want any other talks on any other subjects. And um, yeah, it was great. It was great to to hear about Priest Hill this morning. Thank you so much, Peter and Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
hopefully, um, you know, things are easing now, so we'll be able to get going again. Makes such a difference to know what you can look out for as well. I loved that picture of that pyramidal orchid. My goodness, it was so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're spring up, springing up over the site quite, uh, you know, quite a widespread. Um, it's not just one little section of the chalk scrapes. They're, they're appearing everywhere. Because as Peter said, you know, they're, they're very light seed and they just blow in the wind. So, um, yeah, hopefully you'll see even more in the future. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we'll, we'll leave it there then. Thank you very much once again. And, um, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. Bye. Bye then. Okay. Has Peter gone? I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much, Joe. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, that was so good. I love all your pictures. I'd love to get copies of pictures because I just know that. I mean, if we could use them in our magazine or something. I know we've covered stuff on Priest Hill, but I just think there's endless stories to tell there. So it'd be really great to have that as a, you know, as an asset to just use if we wanted to. Yeah, and I, I think. Um, it's interesting just to look at the um, the construction of the site. Um, you know those photos from when the machines were just going in and uh, uh, tackling the you know the extensive tarmac that was there, and just to be able to see the contrast between that once the tarmac was lifted and the bare chalk, and then a few years later, the uh, you know like the extensive kidney vetch there. That's uh, that's brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm sure Peter, Peter's, I mean, I, I, I've got lots of photos as well. So, um, you know, if there's any particular aspects that you're interested yeah, in, the future, let us know. Yeah. In your talk the other day for the staff meeting, I was like, oh, that's a good picture. That's a good picture. I think particularly <laughs> the ones with all the kidney vetch out there are just stunning. Yeah. Um, be nice to get those ones with that lovely blue sky and the yellow sea of kidney vetch. So <laughs> yeah. Mm. Good. Well, lovely. Thank you very much. That was great. Okay. All right. See how I'll see you around somewhere. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Come and have a look at the site. <laughs> we will. I went there last summer actually with BBC Breakfast. We met up there with Lou Shorthose. They did a small piece from it. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. Yeah. 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 She, she lives very close actually, doesn't she? She just yeah. lives down the road. So it's very mm -hmm. convenient for her. Lovely yeah. Her. yeah. 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 Come back in. Um, Come back probably in June is the best time from the point of view of the butterflies and, and the flowers. Yeah. Because uh, the orchids tend to be orchids and the pyramidal orchids um, would, be, would be June. Yeah. And the, the small blues are at their peak then. Yeah. And I, uh, I mean, one thing Peter didn't mention was just the, um, you know, the numbers of butterflies. But um, the year before last, um, one, one week on the transect, um, David, who, who who does the he's the main walker, transect walker. I think he had something like four hundred and seventy marble whites just uh, on one you know mm -hmm. one one walk. So they you know they they're very they're doing very well there because mm -hmm. uh, I do Howe Hill um, most of the time, and then we just swap over and help each other on holidays. Yeah. So um, it's quite interesting, although they're close and they're similar kind of sites in a way um there are these differences he gets far more far more um marble whites and uh, and also skippers than i do mm. um but uh yeah come and have a look in june <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. okay all right then bye then bye